Okay, well, uh, again, good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening for those connected today. We are glad to see many people attending to our webinar, uh, Women's Participation in Higher Education and STEM in Southern Africa, understanding the regional scenario as part of the celebration of International Women's Day 2023 and of the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. A background study has been done through a survey and desktop study in nine countries, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, and Zimbabwe to determine the role that women in higher education and STEM currently play in the education system. This joint webinar organized by UNESCO's Regional Office for Southern Africa and the UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean YESOC will discuss the preliminary results of the survey in these nine countries. Before starting today's program, we invite the panelists to keep their Microsoft off when not speaking. This meeting will have Portuguese translation, so feel free to select the language of your preference in the Zoom menu. I am Sara Maneiro, Communication Specialist at UNESCO ESAT, and will be the Master of Ceremonies for today's webinar. It is my privilege to introduce our speakers now. Uh, Lydia Arthur Brito is the Regional Director and Representative of the UNESCO Office in Harare. She is a My forest inge engineer, engineer, one of the few women in engineering with a master's and doctorate in forest and wood science from Colorado State University, USA. She was UNESCO's Director of Science Policy and Capacity Building and was the first Minister of Higher Education, Science and Technology of Mozambique. She was also the Director of the UNESCO uh, Regional the Office for Science in Latin America and the Caribbean and UNESCO Representative in Argentina. Paraguay and, and Uruguay. Paraguay Frances Uruguay. Pedro is the director Parts of the UNESCO French International for Institute for, for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, UNESCO and ESAL, since 2019. Previously, he led the education policy team at UNESCO and worked as senior policy analyst at the OECD Center for Educational Research and Innovation. He got his M. ED from the Autonomous University of Barcelona and a PhD in Comparative Education from UNED and a postdoc in Comparative Public Policy at the University of London Institute of Education. So let's give the floor to Lydia Arthur Brito and Frances Pedro who will introduce us to the subject that convenes us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, I guess because I'm the woman, I'm the one starting. <laughs> and because this uh, webinar is uh, uh, part of the celebration of the International Women's Day, so so Fra Francesca, I take the floor first. <laughs> Thank you very much, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody, and uh, allow me uh, to start by recognizing the, the present and the presence of his, uh, its uh, representatives of His uh, Excellency, uh, Professor Amon uh, Munuira, uh, Minister of Higher Education and Tertiary Education, Science and Technology Development of Zimbabwe. Uh, I also see uh, the, His Excellency, the Deputy Minister, connected. Uh, and uh, also the Director General the, uh, of the Department of Higher Education, Science and Innovation in South Africa, Dr. Uh, Phil Mujuara. Uh, of course, I want also to recognize uh, my dear colleague, uh, Francesca Pedro, uh, the Director of UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education, uh, distinguished guests, uh, excellencies, dear participants. It is a pleasure and an honor to welcome you at this side event on women's participation in higher education and STEM in Southern Africa, understanding the regional scenario. As the topic of this year's celebration of the International Women's Day 
is innovation and te technological change and education, uh, education in the digital age for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, concentrating on women in STEM and higher education in Southern Africa is crucial. With Africa youth below 25 years, accounting for more than 60% of Africans' population, now is the time to get our youth, especially young women, into STEM fields and higher education. Dear participants, according to the UNESCO Science Report towards 2030, women make up only 33.3% uh, of the global researchers in higher education and, and, and the research institutes. The alarming factor is that there is initially about 53% of women in undergrad, uh, undergrad degrees and at master's level. But this quickly declines to 44% at PhD level. And of course, when we look to the percentage of women as researchers globally, when we talk about 33.3% 30, 30, uh, 30, of researchers being female researchers, then we really, again, are facing the linking pipe uh, syndrome that has been present for many, many decades uh, in the scientific world. And if we look at engineering and technology, the figures are even more frightening. At the moment, when every sector of society is becoming a technology sector and digital technologies are reshaping every day's life, there are outstanding gender gaps in the digital technologies in general, and especially in artificial intelligence. Today, women and girls are 25% less likely than men to know how to leverage digital technology for basic purpose, four times less likely to know how to program computers and 13 times less likely to file for a, an IC, a ICT patent. Globally, in 2018, only 28% of engineering and 40% of computer science graduates were women. In 2019, in 30 out of 121 countries, fewer than 20% graduates in engineering were women. In 61 out of 115 countries, fewer than 30% of computer science graduates were women. We need to boost the confidence, the confidence of young girls in maths and science fields so that our girls can go on to take careers in the STEM fields that are the jobs of the future. But why is the importance of having women in STEM? Well, firstly, it makes economical sense. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, raising women's workforce participation to the same level at men's for many countries would raise the GDP per capita by significant amounts. For example, in Egypt, would be 34% more GDP. Similarly, the International Monetary Fund predicts that if the number of male and female workers were equal in the United States of America, in Japan and India, then there would be a 5% growth of GDP in the United States of America and Japan would see even more, 9% progression. And India's GDP would have an important increase of 27%. In the age of technology, bringing another 6 million women online would contribute to around 13 to 18 billion dollars to the annual GDP across 144 countries. But the second reason is a question of rights. The woman's right to benefit from scientific knowledge and participate in the co-production of knowledge should be respected and extended to girls and women. The third reason is because STI and STI ecosystems need diversity. To mobilize human ingenuity and creativity, we have to guarantee diverse research teams, female and male, from different disciplines and different social economical backgrounds. The world needs more science, and science needs more women, as we said at UNESCO. 
distinguished participants to determine the situation of women in STEM and higher education in Southern Africa, we have done a background study via a survey and desktop study in nine countries in Southern Africa to determine the role of uh, that women in higher education currently play in education systems and how many of them pursue studies and careers in STEM. This event will discuss the results of the survey in these nine countries, ultimately to enhance capacities of higher education institutions to support women participation in their systems. It is an imperative that our education institutions promote the participation of women in STEM fields, and we at UNESCO are ready to work side by side with governments and higher education institutions to make gender parity in higher education a reality in our region. And I'm very happy that in our participants, we have high level government uh, representatives and that we also have uh, higher education institutions. And uh, because this is what we are trying to, 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 to start here in, in Francisco, I, I'm preempting what you are going to say. Uh, I think between the, the regional office in Arari and, and ESL in Caracas uh, and with SADAC Secretariat, what we are saying is we need to understand the landscape of higher education uh, and, and, and the aspects of, of gender in those systems so that together we can indeed promote not only national and regional policies, but really working in depth uh, with tools and mechanisms uh, to make sure that in this region we can say uh, that we have parity in higher education. And with this, I look forward to a very interesting discussion today and, uh, and the outcomes of, of, of this event. Thank you very much and what a pleasure to be today with you. I think, Lydia, thank you very much. I think I'm going to take the floor just uh, immediately after you. Um, well, you have said everything. Well, let me start maybe by uh, just um, um, greeting the authorities and the representatives of uh, different universities and governments that are with us today. Um, and just um, two or three uh, ideas that I think are going to supplement your excellent introductory presentation. I think that with the overall um, um, uh, you know, speech that you made at the beginning, we already have learned a lot about you know, the importance of making sure that uh, uh, women's participation in, in higher education and also in science and technology are uh, the object of, of our concerns and certainly uh, receive our support. Now, let me start by saying a very simple thing. Um, it goes without saying that uh, gender and particularly the role of women in education is one of the UNESCO's uh, transversal priorities. And um, this is very important for UNESCO, has been so over the past decades, I would say. And thanks to that, we are starting to see some changes. I mean, I started my role as director of, the, of this uh, UNESCO Institute rather three years ago, so three years and a half ago. And I remember that by then, I'm only talking about three years, <clears throat> The discussions about the women's role in higher education were still at the very beginning. And now we can start celebrating some major achievements. Among them, just to supplement uh, the, uh, the data that Lydia has provided uh, to you, uh, among these achievements, I think it is important to realize that starting this June, in four or out of the five most prestigious universities worldwide, according to the um, international rankings that we all criticize, but at the end of the day, we all end using. I mean, in four out of these five uh, most prestigious universities, the rectors, the presidents are going to be women. So this is probably <laughs> something we couldn't dream about just three years ago, and it is, starts to happen. So I mean, probably this is going to develop uh, you know, like a cascade, a very important effect. On a personal note, I have to say that in the three universities where I was in a way educated and also where I started to work, in all of them, in all the three of them, the rectors are now women. So 
you know, I know that this is just uh, um, an indication. It's not necessarily describing the whole uh, complexity of the landscape, but it's good news. Anything, it is important that we share that. Second point I wanted to make is that I'm really happy uh, to join forces with the uh, regional office of UNESCO in Southern Africa for two things. First, because working with Lydia has always been a pleasure and you know and always a win-win situation i have always learned from her a lot and i think that as you probably know i mean her long-standing experience in the area of science technology and higher education as well is a guarantee that uh, we are going to have really a successful project but second as well because this is an indication of something that is also very important to unesco which is south south cooperation I think that having us, the only um, UNESCO, the only United Nations uh, dedicated institute to higher education located in Latin America, working with Southern Africa, it is really an indication that more international cooperation along the lines of South-South can be made, despite the many challenges, including technology, language, that we are uh, facing nowadays. Now, uh, so, really happy and finally the third idea is also you know an explanation of uh, why we are involved in this type of projects i think that both uh, harare as we as we usually say about the regional office and esl our institute are trying to build with your support with the support of governments with the support of institutions and of individuals and members of the university communities we are trying to build like a virtual circle, where we start by asking ourselves, where are we standing now? So what's the evidence? What's the data? And Lydia has already shared some of those with you. But knowing doesn't mean anything. It simply makes you, empowers you, you know, to realize where are you standing? But other than that, you know, we need to do something else, which is to promote change. And we are going to do that in this project through two particular levers. The first one is capacity development, which is certainly the most important part of the UNESCO menu of activities worldwide. We would like to contribute to uh, the development of capacities, not only of uh, government and institutional managers, but also of everyone interested in promoting uh, gender uh, parity and gender equality in, in higher education. That's, that goes without saying. And the second lever, certainly, is to have some uh, policy work in the area either of promoting uh, new regulations at national level, at institutional level. Remember that higher education institutions enjoy worldwide a high level of autonomy, so they are also called to have their own regulations, probably. But, you know, regulations is not all. We also need to make sure that we contribute to the development of public policies, again, at national and institutional level, as a way of really completing this uh, virtual circle and see what the impact of our capacity development and our work on policies may have on the current landscape. You know, So I would like to say that today we are going to talk just about the uh, first uh, piece of this virtuous circle, the first share of that. But certainly, we are, uh, both of us, both uh, the regional office and the institute, are really excited to see, uh, you know, that with you, with your contribution, we can make change happen. Thank you very much. And congratulations again to the whole team in both sides that are making possible this project and making it certainly a success. Back to you, Sarah. Uh, thanks, uh, Director, and thanks to Lydia Brito for uh, both uh, introductory words to the uh, findings that we are going to uh, share today. So uh, for that purpose, uh, we would like to welcome Daniele Vieira, um, Peter Wells, UNESCO Head of Education in Southern Africa, sends his apologies for not being able to participate at this point due to last minute changes in his agenda. So we will proceed uh, presenting Daniele. Uh, she's uh, an assistant professor at the Federal University 
of Pernambuco in Brazil in the Center of Applied Social Sciences, former senior policy analyst at the UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education and former program specialist at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. She holds a PhD from the University of Hamburg, Germany, and has been a visiting scholar in the University of California, Santa Barbara in the US. Previous posts include the German Development Agency GIF and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Welcome, Daniele, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone who is with us today, and bon dia. Um, to the audience who is coming from Mozambique. Um, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to greet you all the speakers of the, of the panel as well, the distinguished members who are here with us today, and also the audience who is join, joining us today worldwide. I will, um, as Sarah said, present some data, some preliminary data that we have from the survey we are doing as part of this uh, research project now with these 90 countries in Africa. And for that, I will show I will share here a, a small PowerPoint presentation. I would like Sarah, you just please to confirm once you can see it shared, so then I can start uh, presenting the data. We can see it correctly. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So as I said, we are gonna present now some data about this project we are doing to understand a little bit the regional scenario that we have in terms of the participation of women in higher education institutions in Southern Africa. And then just to start a little, to start a little bit, I wanted to um, set a little bit the rationale so then the audience can understand a little bit why exactly we did that. What is, what is the stage that we are now? This is a project that has started some time ago, back in 2021, when we did the first study, we did a global survey um, a global um, report to analyze and understand a little bit the participation of women in higher education institutions worldwide. And then what we found out back then is that we have a global female advantage in higher education um, institutions. And then you can see that clear very well here in this graphic that you can see now. So um, when we look into this graphic, what we can see is that uh, we have more women than men in higher education enrollment worldwide. So we can see that the, the females are the most beneficiary or the main beneficiaries in access to higher, higher education in the period that we, under, we analyzed, which was 20 until um, 2000 to 2018. But then you can see here circled in red that we have an exception to this global data, which was exactly the African scenario. So apart from the other regions, what we found out was that in the African case, we had, um, of course, we have doubled um, the, the figures. They have doubled from 2000 until 20, 20, 2018. But we still, we have seen that there were less women um, entering higher education institutions um, than men. And then what we were uh, wondering was that why this is still, or this was still, as we will see, um, the situation in the, in the continent. So then what we did, we analyzed also that there were some persisting um, inequalities. One can see that this is a very good um, figure, um, at least for the female part. So um, historically, less women have accessed higher education institutions. And now we saw that they are entering the institutions more than men. So this can be something positive for us to, to analyze. But we um, saw also that there was some still, there are still some persistent inequalities. So for example, participation of women in the STEM um, subject areas, which is normally called the horizontal gender segregation, the inequalities in terms of the post-graduation degrees, particularly in the professional aid, um, so inequalities also in the professional aid, in the research performance, leadership positions, and also in terms of um, payments. So we had, of course, um, a good uh, female advantage in terms of enrollment, but some inequalities, they still persist. And then based on that, what we did was a pilot um, study, an initial study that we called a first assessment phase, where we wanted to understand a little bit the African um, context. As I just showed you in the graphic, we had a, an exception when we looked at the global data, which was the Africa context. And then we wanted to understand why exactly that was the case. And for that, we did the first assessment. Assessment, what you can see now on the screen is exactly the, um, the cover of this report that has been done. And then we did that uh, with three pilot countries that was Kenya, South Sudan, and Uganda. Of course, we cannot make um, 
contextualize a contextualized analysis of the whole continent based only on three countries. But our idea was really just to do a pilot study to have this first assessment um, um, analysis of, of some countries in the continent. By the, by the time we did this pilot study, we counted with 19 institutions have dropped us in the, um, in the survey. These 19 institutions, uh, most of them, they have developed or themselves or together as part of the national um, policy um, arena, they have developed a couple of policy and legal frameworks to facilitate um, or to increase the participation of women in higher education. So this includes, for example, national policies on gender development, Universities Act, for example, which was implemented in Kenya in 20, um, 20, um, 2012. We had, for example, some equality commissions um, um, implemented, affirmative action policies, the gender education policy. So what we saw in these three countries was that there was quite a positive policy and legal framework taking place. Um, to try to increase the participation of women in those institutions. Some of the mechanisms that were also identified as part of this um, gender equality policy in the countries included affirmative actions. We also saw that some countries were revising some laws, mentoring programs, some gender awareness campaigns. So we, we've seen that there was quite, uh, let's say, a positive scenario, at least to try to change a little bit the situation in terms of the, the participation of women. But it's still in these three countries that took part in the pilot phase, we saw that the participation of women, particularly in leadership positions and in STEM, is still um, um, very low. And then as a follow-up, we have now um, um, what we are calling a follow-up study. And now we want to look more into the Southern African context. And then we, we have decided then to do a second assessment phase. So there you can see on the map, the nine countries which are part of the, of the study. I think we have um, in the audience uh, participants which come, I think, for most, if not all the countries that you can see here. So we have now Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, Eswatini, and Lesotho. So these are the nine countries that we are um, analyzing now. It's also important to say that we don't want to be, this is uh, it's still very preliminary. We're still collecting the data. What we have here now is a preliminary um, analysis to, to share with you. Uh, we don't also want to see, want to have a very descriptive analysis because it's also based on the 38 um, um, institutions that we that have responded to the survey so far. But I think from the answers we have now, we can have a, a good picture of what the situation is in these nine countries. So then they study for now, the objective of the, the research is to analyze the participation, but also the representation of the females in the higher education. We have also included the element of STEM as Professor Lydia Brito has already said, this is an important element for us to analyze the participation of women in those subjects. Um, identify what are, what are these um, inequalities. We saw some uh, inequalities in the global study, and then we wanted to analyze if this is still the case when we look more into the regional context. And then in the end, also provide policy recommendations. Um, um, Dr. Pedro, Professor Pedro has already mentioned that at this stage where we are now, we are only gonna show some of the data. So we are not gonna touch on the aspect of the recommendations and guidelines for now, and um, rather only show some data so you can understand a little bit um, the, the regional context. So what do we want to understand with the data that we are getting? What are the elements that, that we want to understand with the research? So we want to see the female representation in leadership roles, in teaching and research, in enrollment, and in STEM. I can already say from now, for example, that it's very difficult to get access to research data to see how many female researchers are there in comparison to male researchers, access to funding. This is something that we want to gather, but it's a difficult data to, to, to have access. Uh, what are the criteria, for example, that the, the, the um, institutions they, uh, they use or implement when they want to appoint women to, to these leadership positions? If there are any factors, for example, that avoid women from joining these positions of um, in governance and leadership bodies inside the institutions, what are the conditions of employment here? I think we got quite interesting, um, even surprised um, answers. And then if there are any strategies or, or what are the strategies that are needed to increase the participation of women? We are not gonna touch all these elements in our presentation today, just some of them, but this is just for you to understand. So what exactly the study um, is aimed to look at. So then the preliminary findings, that we, we can share with you, just for you to have an idea of the sample profile. So we have here 38 
institutions, um, higher education institutions, they have responded to the survey. You can see here how many institutions have um, answered per country, right? We have quite a good participation from the Zimbabwe um, institutions. When we look at the number of higher education institutions in the, in the country is 21, and we got 15 um, institutions taking part in the sample. We believe this is a good um, figure. But as I said, we don't want to make um, final conclusions about the country um, situation and rather understand what is the situation in these specific institutions that have responded to, to the survey. Um, we have also divided, we had um, institutions which are universities, some institutions are training colleges. It's important to reinforce here that we have a, a small a mistake here in the graphic. When we look, for example, into Mozambique, I know we got some, um, some people from Mozambique in the audience. Um, of course, we have here three, not two, right? Total number of education institutions, institutions as well as for Lesotho here. This, this was just a small mistake, uh, but we have like, 28 universities responded to the survey. And then from the 38 total institutions, we have 10 which are training colleges. So we have like more universities answering the survey than, um, than training, training colleges. You can see the distribution by the, by the country. Um, we also have a division in terms of public and private institutions. We believe that um, um, the figures might be quite different when we look into these different kinds of institutions. Most of the institutions that have responded are public um, higher education institutions, but we also counted with 13 um, public, um, sorry, private um, um, institutions answering the, the, the survey. And then uh, more females than males have answered the survey. The respondents, they were appointed by the, by the institutions and most of them were senior um, um, they had senior management um, positions inside the institutions. So then uh, when we look, for example, to the first aspect, which is the female participation in leadership and governance, what we see is that um, for most of the countries, the only exception is Botswana, but we only had one institution, Botswana. Uh, for the exception is this one. But when we look into the other countries, what we see is that we still have a low participation of women in these um, um, leadership and governance bodies. We have divided here the survey into five different elements. So for example, we wanted to understand the participation of women in the council structure, in the senate structure, the central management team, the dean's office, for example, in the, in the, the team of the dean's office, and also the, the STEM faculty management positions. So if I look, for example, here, let's have a look, for example, in South Africa, and when we look, for example, from the four institutions in South Africa, um, only 36% um, of the positions in the council structure is occupied by women. And then you can see that, let's look, for example, Malawi. If we look to Malawi and we go all the way um, to the um, column on the right, and we look, for example, the STEM faculty management from five um, institutions that have reported to us on this data in Malawi, only 26% um, uh, posts are occupied by women inside the STEM um, uh, management structure. So then, um, as I said, the only exception to that is Botswana, but when we look into the data, we have the majority um, of still of the posts in these decision-making um, 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 positions are still occupied by men. So this is very much in line with the data that we found for the global, uh, for the global study. When we look in the female participation in teaching, for example, we are not going to show research. Um, now we are only going to show teaching. When we look into the teaching position, teaching staff, we also see another representation of, um, of women. So we can see here four different categories, um, starting from the left to the right columns. So we have the professors, the associate professors, we have the senior lecturers or the middle ranked staff. And we also have the junior lecturers or the teaching staff at the more junior level. And if we start, for example, with the column on the left, looking to the professor's um, um, positions, we will see that we have very low participation um, um, of women. We compare the data um, in these two periods to 2018 and 2021. We also, it's imp also important to say that we have like the pandemic, the COVID pandemic in between. And we believe that this has, might have influence in the data. But overall, what we see here is that, particularly when we look into the professors, that we see that we have less women um, as a proportion of all the professors than we have for men. 
the, the, the data that we don't have in Blanca is the data that um, um, the, the institutions, they have not provided, they didn't have this, the, this data. So we see, for example, that once we go up in terms of seniority, we see less women. If you go all the way to the right, when we look into the junior lecturers position, we see a better picture um, in terms of participation of women in both years to 2018, 2021, in some of the countries. Um, Mozambique is an exception here. Um, from, of course, it's important to say, from the, the institutions which have reported. Uh, but we see a better picture in terms of the, when we look into the junior um, positions. But as I said, once we go up in the level of seniority, we see very few um, um, positions which are occupied by, by women. When we look now into the conditions of employment, the female conditions of employment, here we have um, a data which um, um, has um, surprised us a little bit, positively surprised. So we have asked also the, the, in the survey, uh, what are the conditions of employment when we look into uh, in terms of the benefits and then the, the, the overall infrastructure for the women to work on those institutions. And then we have asked, for example, about equal payment policies. We have asked about the social benefits, for example, if in terms of pension, medical insurance, holidays, um, leave, if the conditions are the same both for men and women. Um, in maternity leave, what are the, um, if, if these maternity benefits, um, um, maternity leave benefits exist for women, but also paternity benefits, it's also important that we, we reinforce that. So the benefits should not only be for, me, for females, we also should have benefits for, for, the, for the fathers or the fathers to be. So we also ask that in, um, in terms of the promotion, the appointments, if they think that the women are disadvantaged. So we have here the data divided by the kinds of institutions that have answered, the public institutions, the private, the training colleges. Uh, and what you can see here is that for the majority of the respondents, um, the conditions of employment for the females in the institutions are positive. They have good conditions of employment. So most of the institutions, they apply equal payment policies, the social benefits, they are there. Um, particularly when we look into the public um, um, higher education institutions, which is the highest number of institutions that have responded to the survey, you can see that most of them have agreed that these policies, they exist, that they have 78%, for example, of the institutions, uh, of the respondents agree that the institutions have maternity uh, benefits. So this was a good, um, a good picture here. The exception is when we look into the column here of the paternity benefits. So when we look into the paternity benefits, we see a different picture. So most of the respondents, they, they strongly disagree or they disagree. Uh, so they think that the, the paternity benefits are, are non-existent or are not good enough for the, for the fathers or the spouses, um, the fathers of the spouses who, who have given birth. Um, so this was a part, as I said, apart from this aspect of the paternity leaves, we, we, we consider this a quite a, a, a positive picture. And then we also have data in terms of enrollment. What is the female enrollment in the different categories inside the institutions? So here, for example, you can see the bachelor enrollment. Um, this, is a, this is a positive data. When we look into the females from a female perspective, so we have more um, female bachelors than, um, than male bachelors. It's um, interesting that you see in the graphic that we have a difference in terms of enrollment and graduation. Maybe this is a data that we could look into more detail. Maybe um, as um, um, Professor Dr. Pedro has mentioned, that there is an intention to do some capacity building, work more closely with the institutions. I think this is a data that might be interesting to discuss uh, why there are so many um, um, females and also males, it's not only females, but also males entering the institutions and the graduation um, rate is so low um, so you can see here, of course, uh, we also have to take into consideration that we have here in the in between a gap, which is the COVID gap, and then we believe that this might have an influence on why the graduation rate um, was so low for the sample that we analyzed. But here for the bachelor enrollment, we see an advantage of females. So we see that the same that I just showed here we have in percentages, so there are more females than males in entering the institutions, but also um, um, graduating the institutions. When we look into the post-graduation enrollment, it's the same. We also see an advantage of females, and we also see this um, low level of graduation. Again, it's important to say that maybe this might be due to the COVID um, pandemic, but here we also see the advantage of females in comparison to the, to the males in both years that we studied. 
Um, but then the, 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 the exception, the data, is when we look into the doctoral and postdoctoral enrollment. And this is also in line with what we saw with the global data. So for the uh, lower levels uh, uh, inside the, the, the institutions, the bachelor and postgraduates, we are seeing more women entering the, those, those courses. But when we look into the doctoral and postdoctoral enrollment, we see the advantage of, of men. It's close here for the sample that we, that we see, but, but we have an advantage of men. So this is the exception. Again, the graduation rate is low, and we also think this is due to the COVID pandemic. So as I just mentioned in the previous slide, these are the percentages. So we have the, um, um, the positions, um, more men than females, not only entering, but also graduating in the doctoral and postdoctoral enrollment. It's important to emphasize. Um, the only exception to that, the, the, to that, as you can see here, is Namibia. Um, this, this data that we showed that you can see here in percentages is the same data that we have here distributed by the countries. We just put here for you to see that the exception is Namibia. In Namibia, we have uh, more females than males in the doctoral and postdoctoral enrollment, but for the other countries, they have reported um, Botswana and Lesotho have not provided, they didn't, they have not provided data, but for the other countries, um, the, the institutions in the other countries, they have reported, we see an advantage of men. The only exception is Namibia, as you can see here, uh, where we have more females in the doctoral and postdoctoral enrollment. And in the end, we have also analyzed um, the female enrollment in STEM, as um, um, has been said at the beginning of the panel. This, this is still very preliminary. We still have to look um, into more detail um, in, and receive more um, answers from other institutions. So what we have now that we see, for, for the data we have now, we see for the institutions, for the 38 institutions that have reported, we see that there are more men than women in STEM enrollment in general. So when we look in the whole population of students in the STEM subjects and courses, we see majority of men. So there are more men in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the number is quite um, 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 significant when we look here. And it's important to say that um, a couple of minutes ago, I just showed the enrollment in bachelor and post-graduation courses and the women were in advantage. But when we look in STEM, we have the, the vast, um, the majority um, presence of men, the vast advantage of men, of males. So um, as Professor Lida was saying at the beginning of the, of the panel, this is, this is still uh, uh, the case. And this is not only the, the scenario in Africa, but this is the one that we are analyzing now. So to finalize uh, my, my input here in the, in the panel, some of the key messages that we have for now, uh, the ones that you can see here, we still have underrepresentation of women in the decision-making and leadership bodies in the institutions that we have studied, in the 38 institutions that we have studied. Inequalities still in terms of the professor rate. So in general, the senior staff professors, associate professors, um, the most seniority um, um, positions, they are uh, a minority, women are a minority. The only exception was the institution that have reported in Botswana. Um, the good news is that the respondents, they have um, um, reported quite a, a good level of conditions of employment. So for, for the institutions that have been analyzed, they consider the, the conditions of employment for the females, for the women, are uh, satisfied, satisfactory. Um, we also saw in line with the global data that we had that there is a gender segregation, not only vertical segregation, but also horizontal segregation. So, of course, we have female advantage in bachelor enrollment, as I mentioned, but a disadvantage in doctor and postdoctoral enrollment. So once we go in seniority, not only in terms of employment, but also in terms of studies and research, we see more males than females in the horizontal gender segregation. So across all the components of STEM, women are still a, a minority. Just to finalize, we also wanted to reinforce that the, we found some data gaps. This is something that we want to look into more detail in the next phases of the research in terms of um, lack of data on research performance and research funding, for example. This is something that we think would be interesting to analyze, to, to, to understand um, the distribution of research fund and the distribution in terms of research performance by females and, and males. This is something that it's a data that it's lacking for now what we think would be interesting to, to, to understand. So I would stop the, the, the presentation for now and um, thank you very much for your attention. I will stop the presentation. Sara, I will go back to you.
Thanks so much, uh, Daniele, for sharing this relevant and detailed data related to the research in progress in reference to women's participation in higher education in Southern Africa. Our next, our next guest is uh, Phil Nijuara, Director General of the Department of Higher Education Science and Innovation of South Africa. He has served as Professor of Science and Technology Policy at the University of Pretoria and Physics Lectureship at the Universities of the Witwatersrand, South Africa and Port Hare. He has worked as a director in the former Department of Arts, Culture, Science and Technology, serving on the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Group Executive for Research and Development in, and in Strategic Human Capital Development at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Over to you, Dr. Nijuara. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really delighted to be a part of these uh, discussions. Uh, in the um, talk that we were going to give, we wanted uh, your excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to, to share the problem we have in South Africa. But I think the study that has just been presented suggests that uh, I need to focus on specific interventions that we have uh, embarked on in order for you to get a sense of how we are addressing some of the detail uh, that the presentation ha has just shown. So we want to congratulate uh, UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa for hosting this important webinar. It is timely for us as the UN Commission on the Status of Women is currently meeting in New York to evaluate progress and formulate concrete policies to promote gender equality and the advancement of women worldwide. In fact, I am going to leave you immediately after this because we are participating here in New York. I'm uh, speaking to you here in New York. So program director, we also know from a range of studies that gender inequality in higher education persists throughout the world. Even in developed countries such as the United Kingdom, only one in five professors are women. In South Africa, women also are underrepresented in the area of permanent academic staff as they comprise approximately 43% in public higher education institutions. This inequality becomes even more pronounced at senior academic positions where women account for approximately 18.5 women professors and only 29.8 uh, as associate professors. So we know the barriers that they have and you've heard from the study. So I won't bore you uh, with, with, with the detail, but what I'd like to do is that in response then to the challenges that are faced by women in the higher education sector and post-school education, our Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation commissioned a ministerial task team study on the recruitment retention and progression of black South African academics in South African universities. And those of the study titled Building the Next Cater of Emerging Researchers in South Africa. And we call this silent majority because what we found in South Africa is that we have this large number of uh, researchers uh, or black academics, but they're not uh, uh, involved in research. A concurrent study on building the next cadre of emerging researchers in South Africa focused on the many black and female researchers in emerging researcher cohort uh, was commissioned and sought to answer two key questions to establish the proportion of senior lecturers and lecturers who have PhDs who are publishing and active in seeking research funds and understand the environmental context enablers and impediments to increasing the number of emerging researchers at systemic and institutional and individual levels. So what I'd like to do now is to take the um, findings of this ministerial task team. What it observed is that institutional cultures and practice impediments such as racism, sexism, competing academic responsibilities, lack of role models and mentors, the inability to embark on a research career are significant barriers 
that work against the recruitment, retention, and progression of Black academics. So in particular, the study made the following recommendations, therefore, that universities need to do more to tackle racism and sexism in all forms, including through penalizing perpetrators and building anti-racism and anti-sexist culture. Progress towards the achievement of equity targets should be built into the performance agreement uh, of SENA University Management. And that in South Africa, we expect the Department of Higher Education and Training, our sister department and the Department of Labor to review the extent to which universities comply with employment equity legislation. And number four, funding for postgraduate studies and recruitment strategies must take equity uh, issues into account. And this will require what we call fit for purpose financial packages to respond to the challenges that prevent students, especially South African black and female students from progressing effectively along this pathway. And then lastly, universities should ensure greater participation by African and female South African doctoral students in postgraduate enrollments, and especially in fields where participation patterns remain in inequitable. So in other words, it's the policies that were designed or proposed uh, by the study that suggested that we can make specific interventions to address the challenges faced by women. So second, I would like to now focus on the findings of the recommendations of building the next generation cadre of emerging researchers in South Africa. The study observed that emerging researchers are underfunded, even though they largely comprise the underrepresented demographic groups, namely black and women in the system. Thus, as a result of this, there's a low proportion of emerging researchers that are PhD qualified who publish and actively seek research funding. In response to its findings, the study made the following recommendations. Universities should be aware of the increasing dis disillusionment of young and women scholars with current research performance culture and implement appropriate countermeasures. And two, Universities should consider implementing differentiated research performance appraisal systems for emerging scholars, and that more investments in mentorship for young and women researchers must be made available. And to this effect, in fact, the University of South Africa, the group of vice chancellors, are doing the study to look at how a mentorship program can be designed for emerging scholars, in particular women in South Africa. So the second issue that I wish to focus on are some of our interventions that are aimed at improving the inclusion and representation of women in our higher education institutions. As it related to the pipeline of women in research and research leadership positions, the 2021 Post-School Education and Training Macro Indicators Trends Report reveals that female students continue to be in the majority in all fields of study that include business and management, education and humanities within the university sector. It further reveals that male students still outnumber female students in science, engineering, and technology fields, similar to the study that uh, we've received, even though with a drastically narrowing gap, and we are very happy about this. Notably, when it comes to graduations in the science, uh, education, and training, uh, sorry, science, engineering, and training, the number of female graduates started outstripping those of males uh, from 2014 and, 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 and going forward. So we are really happy about these numbers that Jim seem to show that in the graduations, uh, we are seeing more female graduate uh, than, than male graduates. So what this means is that the throughput rates in science, engineering, and technology are comparatively better for female students. So historical empirical data has always shown that the participation of, of women in higher education is greater at the levels of undergraduate studies as we had in the study and early postgraduate studies, but decreases higher up in the academic and leadership trajectory uh, with women severely underrepresented in the professorate and in leadership and management positions as you had in the study. But there are successes worth recognizing and would like to share these with you. 
at the downstream components of the human capital development pipeline. What we found in South Africa is that in the higher education management information services data, we see that the number of female PhD graduates in public universities have increased from 1,182 in 2016 to 1,540 uh, in 2020, accounting for 42 and 43 percent of total PhD graduates respectively. So the numbers are showing uh, some positive uh, uh, performance. The system anticipates that overall female PhD graduations and, and enrollments will increase in response to the ongoing deliberate and intention support interventions given to female students. But however, we must bear in mind that female students have been outnumbering male students for some time in humanities, economic management, but one science, engineering, and, and technology major fields at undergraduate level. So in order to address this in 2013, the minister approved guidelines on achieving equity in the distribution of bursaries and scholarships. And these have been firmed up and incorporated into our funding policy at the National Research Foundation. What these guidelines do uh, is that they expect a minimum of 55% of female postgraduate students to receive support. So it's targeted at females. It also pleases us to note that uh, our entity, the National Research Foundation, reports that it has consistently achieved the target of funding 55% female students at honors and master's level. However, the target of 55% female students supported at PhD level has been inclusive. So we need to, to continue to support students uh, with bursaries at this level of 55% for PhD. In October 2014, the Department of Higher Education and Training introduced the Staffing South Africa's University Framework SSAUF. And this is a program which takes a starting point, uh, the urgent and challenging imperative to recruit, support, and retain Black and female academic staff to address their very serious underrepresentation at all levels. So what this uh, framework does, uh, it focuses on academic development pathway, which includes both research development and teaching uh, development in the uh, staffing transformation at university. So the framework differentiates between several distinct, distinct groups and strategies for addressing recruitment processes and development needs for each of the identified groups. And what the strategy uh, does is, is for recruitment and development of new staff, uh, what we call the next a generation of academics program and nurturing emerging scholars program. It also looks at the improvement of the effectiveness of currently employed staff in terms of qualifications and occupational competencies, teaching, research, community engagement, and development towards professorship, what we call the Futures Professors Program and the development of academics into leadership and management positions. So when you heard about the study that you had earlier on, it's as a result of these specific interventions. So we are very, very happy that as part of the, these interventions, uh, the Nurturing Emerging Scholars Program now has 90% Black South African and 55% Black women uh, recruitment target. So again, you, you have a set number of people that you are targeting uh, for this. The new generation of academics program has transformation intake goals of 80% Black and 55% women. So again, these are targeted specific uh, uh, programs. Of the total 655 employed and currently active next generation academic professors, lecturers, 57% are female and a sizable component 55% are, are being black females. And as part of the existing staff capacity enhancement program, there are four phases that have been implemented with support provided to more than 200 academics to acquire PhDs. And we're very, very happy with this. The Future Pro Professors Program, a total of 89 emerging researchers have been enrolled and 51 of them or 57% are, are women. So, and they are in the uh, SET field. 
And then uh, the DSI also uh, has implemented two flagship research grants programs targeted at young black and women emerging researchers. These are Tutuga program and black academic advancement program, which support emerging researchers holding academic or research positions at South African public universities and public research institutions. Over the last three years, the Tutuga program and the black academic program funded just over just under 2,000 emerging researchers grants for South African citizens and permanent residents, and 61% went to women. So in conclusion, Chair, we are mindful of the fact that in spite of our many interventions and those of our stakeholders, there are still some gaps in the system, and there is a need to accelerate the work that seeks to improve the position of women as researchers and decision makers within our education system. It is therefore our hope that this meeting uh, will take some of the lessons that we have learned and we are more than happy to share these studies with you uh, to develop best practices and practical recommendations on how we can enhance government interventions to drive the broader transformation agenda. I wish you well in your deliberations and as I say, I will probably disappear immediately into the next meeting uh, which I have to attend immediately, but thank you very much for asking us to come and share our um, experience and our interventions with yourselves. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Uh, Phil Nijuara, for joining this session today and for highlighting the challenges ahead for achieving equity in higher education and for the improvements and interventions needed for this purpose. Our next guest, His Excellency Amon Murguaira, Minister of Higher Education and Tertiary Education, Science and Technology Development, Zimbabwe, could not attend. Representing the ministry, we have the presence of Mr. Sonono, Acting Chief Director of Human Capital Planning and Skills Development in Zimbabwe. Over to you, Mr. Sonono. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the moderator, can you allow me to ride on the already established uh, protocols or observed protocols? Um, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to UNESCO, International Institute for Higher Education, Higher Education in, 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 in Latin America and the Caribbean, and, and Caribbean and the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa for organizing the survey on women in higher education. Uh, today is more special considering that only yesterday the world was celebrating the International Women's Day. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development is fully articulated by sustainable development goal number four, which states that ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. SDG number four, most importantly aims at transforming lives through education and recognizing the important role of education in social and economic development. Through incorporating key drivers such as access, inclusive, inc inclusion and equity, gender equality and lifelong opportunities, li lifelong learning opportunities. The African Union's cont continental education strategy for Africa 2016 to 2025 outlines the continent's ambitions which pinpoints Africa's responsibility to step up into the challenge of defining objectives vis-a-vis -vis the future we want while leaving no one behind. The 
since 2020, 2016 to 2025, demonstrates that Africa would, would, li would like to not only own the global sustainable development goals, but adapt and make them compatible with its aspirations as there is no one size fit for all. When it comes to wants and the needs, the goals and the intents of CISA 2020 to, to, to 20, 2016 to 2025 are ambitious as they seek to achieve better results than in previous education strategy, strategy frameworks. Be they regional or international. Devel the development agenda also draws lessons from previous continental plans and strategies about the role and the place of the African Union Commission which unlike no, number states uh, unlike member states is no territory for the implementation of strategies in the field furthermore it capitalized on numerous and active players ready to mobilize financial human and technical resources within national regional and continental coalitions for education, science, and technology. That's CISA 2016 to 2025 seeks to provide each education stakeholder with the opportunity to make his or her best contribution to education and training in Africa. Higher education plays a role in the implementation of sustainable development goals. However, there are steps and structure, structures which are necessary for this to be possible. In achieving this, the Zimbabwe government is implementing a heritage-based education 5.0 philosophy. The philosophy the philosophy encourages higher and tertiary education institutions to work directly with policymakers, societies in implementing SDGs. The philosophy entrenches an adaptive approach that speaks to teaching, research, community service, innovation, and industrialization. That is homegrown. Of and of of all of and of course is taking a cue from of course taking a cue from the other best practices. In all this, the focus is on leaving no one and no place behind. Globally, the number of students enrolled in higher education is on the rise. It is estimated that they, there will be 380 million higher education students by 2030. Enrollment in Zimbabwe's universities shows that female students were more than male students in the past two to three years. The Education Statistics Report 2018 to 2020 released by the Zimbabwe National Statistics Agency in December 2021 states that 50,699 female students were recruited in universities in 2018 compared with 43,432 males while in 2019, 60,149 women were enrolled in comparison to 51,535 men. In 2020, the numbers were 62,000. 
53,699 respectively. In science, technology, and engineering, in science, technology, engineering, and the mathematics, that is STEM, females are underrepresented. This trend may be similar to other countries and, 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 and regions in Africa. However, in sub-Saharan African males are overrepresented with 73 female students enrolled for every 100 female. Uh, that is according to UNESCO ISL 2021, IESLALC 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a great need for increased investment in, in higher education in Africa to establish sustainable quality education systems. Positive steps need to be taken to increase women in STEM disciplines and increase cooperation in higher education regionally and continentally. We look forward to hearing the result of the survey, which will guide us in ensuring increased participation of women in higher education. I want to take this opportunity to thank you. I come to the end of this report. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, thank you uh, for your words, uh, Mr. Sonono, and for reminding us of the importance of SDG 4 and SDG 5 in the economic development of the African continent. As we run out of time, we uh, invite the audience to post any questions in the Q&A section of Zoom and Rovani Sigamoni the Education Program Specialist at UNESCO Office in Harare will reply to you shortly. And for the closing uh, part or, of, of this session, we would like to invite uh, Frances Pedro, Director of UNESCO YESALC, and Lydia Brito, uh, Regional Director and Representative of uh, UNESCO Office in Harare, for the closing words. Over to you. Director. Francesco, this time I, I, I pass to you the first. <laughs> with, with pleasure, no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, look, it has been really a learning experience um, from the very beginning, from when Lydia addressed our um, um, the audience with the introductory remarks, um, you know, with these two uh, presentations, which show the enormous potential that policy interventions are already having uh, in, in Southern Africa. I think that there is so much to learn from this exchange of experiences. And I believe that our, um, in a way, our contribution is just um, an, an opening window to a wonderful reality of multiple possibilities of action that lie before, before us. Um, I really congratulate myself for being part of this exercise and hope certainly that we are going to meet again very soon just to comment on the uh, fruitful results and the next steps that we are going to um, uh, start together. Now, once again, let me, let me express my gratitude to the colleagues in Harare for uh, you know, being a wonderful companion in this journey and hope that this is just the beginning of a more uh, fruitful cooperation in the future. Once again, thank you very much. And, and of course, thank you also to the colleagues at, at the Institute and particularly Daniele for the excellent work that is an appetizer of what is coming afterwards. Thank you very much. And back to Lydia again. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Francesc. And uh, really thank you to all the participants and uh, distinguished authorities 
uh, like Francesco said, and I think Daniela also was very clear on that, this is just the beginning. And, and I hope, uh, Francisco, when we were talking about appetite, I hope uh, the institutions, the higher education institutions and tertiary education in the countries would feel like uh, more willing to, to, to respond to the surveys. We really need data. If there is something that I, uh, I was thinking as, as, as the, the, the deputy, uh, the, the director general uh, of South Africa and also the, the PS uh, in, here in Zimbabwe were talking about and giving the data and national data. Uh, I was thinking we really need more institutions to participate in a, in a survey, and I and I think this is one of the the first thing that I would call uh, as we finish this first uh, seminar. Uh, let's make sure that we can engage our institutions to really respond to the surveys, because the more detailed the data is, uh, and the, the the more granality we have in the data then it's much easier to work both with governments and with institutions to really support the, the transformation that is so necessary uh, in our education systems, not only from a perspective of gender, but also in terms of relevance uh, of those systems to the development of, of, of our countries, of our region. Uh, the second point then I, I also would like to, to put forward, uh, this is a beginning of a conversation. So, dear participants, every time you, you are invited, do come. Uh, and uh, hopefully next time we will have a more interactive uh, discussion with you. You are putting questions that we are trying to respond. But, uh, but we are hoping that this is really a conversation that we can also interact more near you. Today was a, a kickoff uh, of, of a first uh, uh, idea, a first uh, uh, landscape of what our education and gender looks like in, in the nine countries of Sad, uh, Sadak. Uh, but, uh, but we need your contributions. We need more, uh, more, more interactions. So the, the second call I would like to, to do at the, the end of this, uh, this first interaction is that let's continue the dialogue, bring other, other colleagues of yours that may be interested also in these topics and, uh, and, uh, and, and let's have these conver conversations in a regular basis because that's what gives us the yeah, ideas and also the energy uh, and the, the knowledge to, to, to really act and uh, towards our formation. And finally, really, again, thank you our teams, both uh, Ian Salk and, uh, and the Arari team uh, for, for the wonderful work. I know these surveys are not easy processes to get and, uh, and it was also done in a quite short time. Uh, but like you said, Francesca, the, the teams work very well together. So that's, that's very nice to see. Uh, but really all the participants and the authorities that throughout the beginning of this project have supported us in, in this research project. Thank you very much to all, a continuation of a good day, uh, a good evening for the ones that are more late in the day. Uh, and really looking forward to see uh, all of you again uh, as we continue this conversation. Well, thanks to all our attendees and the speakers, and we will keep you posted. Uh, we will make sure to keep you posted of uh, the results of all this uh, research that is in progress. Uh, so uh, continue to have uh, a, a good day and good uh, celebration of International Women's Day and um, a great uh, end of the week for all of you and for, uh, for the team involved. Thank you. <laughs>